See everybody this morning. Worthy is the Lamb.
worthy. And uh, I am so glad to be. Us. They are a good phrase uh, from yesterday. We had our men's breakfast, our annual men's breakfast at the Nichols House. It's a great time. Lots of good food. I mean, more food than you could ever imagine. All right, but then it was all good. And uh, even for that, but it's also uh, Brother Ed likes to take up, you know, just a collection of whatever people donate and give it to a project and sometimes to missionaries. Ten dollars yesterday. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. That's all He gave us. Man, we can sing His praises for eternity. And that's salvation, eternal salvation in Christ. We have that. reading today it says ye are the light of the world Matthew 5 14 through 16 a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven so man, as we worship him today praise the Lord he saved us man let's just lift up today and may he see our worship but greater than that, this is just the beginning. We have the whole week to live out. God help us to do that. Man, I appreciate you all being here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for our service at this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much indeed for the fact that you are worthy because you have done uh, beyond the call of duty for us, Lord Jesus. You have done so much. You have poured out your blessings upon us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for eternal salvation. We thank you for the abundant life that we have in you. We thank you for the, the many blessings, Lord. We, we thank you that we have a confidant that we can go through the, the struggles of life with and who's there present with us and who knows our infirmities. God, you are familiar with exactly the, the temptations we go through, the infirmities that we face, and yet you are without sin, and you give us victory, and you give us Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you for your love. We ask that you be honored and glorified in everything that we say and do in our service today. We ask in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to, to briefly go through the missionary of the month. Uh, this month, it's Dale and Janet Brown. They're from New Zealand. Uh, they've been there since the late 80s, and they've been setting up churches in New Zealand. They have three children, Josh, Nathan, and Micah, and it's a ministry that we've supported. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the worship team. All right, if I can get you to stand uh, with us one more time, we're going to do uh, Manson Over the Hilltop. Uh, it's one of my uh, favorite songs.
started singing this morning, um, we're going to do uh, at Calvary 492 in your hymnal of your I'm sure they have that on the board for us. All right. Another one of my favorite songs. Good thing uh, about being able to pick the songs. That's right. Pick my favorite. Okay. Pretty stuff, is it? <laughs> <laughs> It always seems to work out that, you know, when you have three pages of music to look at, you don't have a wide enough platform to sit. How Christians are broken, we aren't perfect, and we have to.
Sometimes people think, well, in order to get to Jesus and go to church, man, I need to pick myself up and clean myself off, get all nice and pretty and go. You know what? The prodigal son didn't teach us that. That prodigal son lifted up his... It's not the parable of the prodigal son, I don't think. I think it's the parable of the father. It's all about the father and his reaction. But when that son was walking toward his father's house, did the father sit up there on the porch and just go, yeah, here he comes. I knew he was coming back. Nope. The Bible tells us he ran to the son. And then the son stained, mud-stained, filth, and in his rags, the father grabbed him in his arms and he gave him a big hug and he threw a party for him. Man, you want to come to Jesus, just come. Come as you are. And Jesus will take you up in his arms. If you put your faith and trust in him, he will save you gloriously. And he will change you and he will make you, well, God's son, God's daughter. And uh, you can go from rags to riches in just a moment. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, that's not preaching, that's free. All right. <laughs> so turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. We're still in 1 John. We just kicked off this series on the um, family of God. And we talked last time about fellowship and the importance of fellowship and what fellowship is and where it began. Uh, somebody want to help me out. Where did fellowship begin? You're, you're heading in the right direction. It began to That's right. It began even before creation. All right. Hey, if you're, if you're joining us by live stream, we're kind of privileged to have you with us. 
Yeah. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the service so far and enjoy the preaching today and it challenges your heart. If you're uh, visiting with us here in the, the church uh, with us, we do have a card we'd like you to fill out. It's right in the pew in front of you. If you're visiting with us, you can grab one of those. Just fill it out. This helps me as a pastor make more of a connection with you. Drop that in the offering plate later on when you take that. That'll get to me. And uh, that'll give us also a record of your visit. We've got a privilege of having you with us. And uh, so you can. The first part, again, we talked about the, the full joy of fellowship. This week we're looking at common bonds. So read with me 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This then is the message which ye, we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is, and say that with me, God is. Say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all. Note that word. Underline it. Highlight it. If you write your Bible at all. Man, mark that word off. I don't care what it is. You can think of the most heinous sin that you can think of. The Bible tells us that he will forgive. All right, uh, look at, uh, and it cleanses from all unrighteousness. Look at verse 10. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so here we are, we're looking at the, what I call common bonds. There's two of them. That we're going to see in the scripture today, but first I want to talk about what a bond is. Everybody understand what a bond is, or you know what a bond is. I'm talking about a monetary bond. In our day and time, when people are investing, you know, they have little apps that you can download an app on your phone and you can make little investments into the stock market. Like just, I mean, on the fly, you can make little investments. And in I know a guy that's a friend of mine that does that. He makes pretty good money on that. But you can do that. I mean, we are. We live in a, a world, a society, when we have all kinds of technology at our fingertips. You can invest, and you can you can watch your money grow almost instantaneous. You can do all these things, and in the time that we live in, when we have uh, we've had the impact of COVID, we've had the impact of other issues. We've had we see man markets uh, gaining and then plummeting. We see all this going on, and we. Get it. We can easily think about bonds, think about you know monetary bonds, you know different type of bonds that there are. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about bonds. If you look in the definition, I love the the uh, first definition too. That there's two that in the definition of the dictionary that I looked at. Number one is this: a bond is a connection between two objects that have been joined together, especially by adhesive substance, heat, or pressure. All right, you understand that? It's a connection between two objects. The other definition of bonds, uh, which also applies to this, what we're talking about today, is a relationship between people based on shared feelings, interests, or experiences. Relationship between people based on shared feelings, interests, or experiences. So a bond, you might think uh, famously, uh, Super glue, right? Remember the old super glue commercials where they would put the super glue on the guy's heart, you know, hard hat and put it on. And man, they'd have him hanging from a, a steel beam by the super glue on the hat, you know. It just dries, you know, 30 seconds. You got the strong bond and, you know, you can. Now, I wouldn't want to try that, you know, hang from a 20 sword building by your hat. <laughs> There's no way you get me out there. But could you imagine that? What we talk, we think about, we might think about super glue. We might think about different bonds in our life, things that we have used. Maybe we, we think of the bond of wealthy. You know, wealthy bonds, bonds, uh, two pieces of metal together and uh, to create maybe something stronger or some kind of uh, product out of that. Um, we might think of the bond of friendship. We might think of the bond of marriage. All these are great bonds, and they really all are in likeness to these two bonds that we're going to talk about today. Again, we were talking about the family of God. So these two bonds apply specifically to us as believers, to Christians, all right? And look at the first bond with me. 
Um, and I'll take you to verses uh, 6, 8, and 10 is where these are in, this bond is emphasized. And it is the bond of sin nature. The bond of sin nature. Now you say, Pastor Sean, this isn't a very nice bond. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it may not be, but it's reality. It's reality. Look at, look at verse 6. He said, uh, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie not and do not the truth. You know, every one of us have walked in darkness. I want you to understand that today. We, we might see that phrase and think, well, you know, I, I don't know. I'm a pretty good person. I don't care how good a person you think you are. You have walked in darkness. Oh, I'm out of my bounds. There I'm going back yet. All right, there I am. All right. Hello, Facebook man. I'm back. All right. Um, walking in darkness. We all walked there. Some of us, I can say, well, you know, excuse me, Pastor, but um, I'm pretty, you know, no, you walked in darkness. Look at, look at verse, um, look at verse eight. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we what? We deceive ourselves. Now, notice that's in the present tense. If somebody were to say, I have no sin, you're deceived. Can I tell you that today, sitting in this auditorium today in a church in uh, Liberty Baptist Church in Howell, Michigan, in the United States of America, every one of us, the fact of the matter is, are dealing with sin. Now, we wouldn't, but if we went across the room today and everybody had taken the, you know, the, the honesty to room or whatever you want to call it, we were to tell what was going on in our life, we would know that every one of us are struggling. All right? So in some way, with sin. <clears throat> not only that, but look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in it. So there are some people, even in John's day, and you've heard some people today that think they, that some people think that you can reach sinless perfection in this life. You ever heard somebody say that? I, I've heard of that belief. Um, I've not personally met somebody that told me they were sinlessly perfect. My first question, if it was a guy, I'd be, well, let's talk to your wife about that. <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> All right? But, there's this belief that man, I can I can be sinlessly perfect. No. The reality is no. We struggle with sin in the present. We've always struggled with sin in the past. Uh, every one of us is a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a one of us that have it. And so the fact of the matter is today we have the bond of sin nature. Number one, and we see that because our world is cursed by sin. You go back to Genesis 3 and you look at the, the historical event of Adam and Eve and you see what took place and you see God's pronouncement of curse upon, upon Adam, upon Eve, and upon this world. This world is cursed by sin. We all live in the same world, right? We all live here on planet Earth, the third rock from the sun, right? And this world that we live in is cursed by sin. So we all experience the effects of sin just by that. Not only that, but we all have a body infected by sin. We all have a body that's infected by sin. And you say, well, you know, some of us struggle with different diseases. We know somebody maybe that's had cancer. We know somebody that's had maybe another type of disease or virus or something that's come in and has made pain, has, has, has racked them and, and, and given them much difficulty. But there's not one disease that's ever worse than this disease of sin, and we all have it. It's all, it's affecting all of our bodies. <clears throat> we know that because the Bible so many times throughout Scripture talks about, especially in the New Testament, about the flesh. That we deal with this flesh, and this carnal flesh has a bent toward what? Toward sin, toward evil. This flesh that we have. So we have a body affected by sin, we have a world cursed by sin, but number three, we have a heart compromised with sin. We have a heart, and that heart, not the heart that's pumping blood within you, but that you of you, that inner you, who's the real you, it's, it's compromised with sin. Uh, meaning that it's been weakened, it's, it's a struggle, it's, it's, the Bible says our heart is desperately wicked, who can know it? Wow. <laughs> man, man, you say, well, Pastor Sean, there's not a lot of hope there. Well, hold on. 
All right, we have a heart compromised with sin. Now, notice he said there in verse 6 that uh, walk in darkness. <clears throat> that has the idea of to be occupied with. The word that's translated walk there has the idea of to be occupied with. So this person that John's talking about here in verse 6 that says, that these people that say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. These are people who would proclaim that they knew Christ in some fashion or form, and yet they are occupied with darkness. Now, for us as believers, praise God, God it's not of our own uh, works or our own efforts, but since we have been saved, we are not occupied with darkness anymore. We are occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ, with the light. And we are occupied with him, and he, he's the one that dominates our thoughts more than anything. But that doesn't mean that we don't struggle with darkness still. We live in a world that's dark. We're, we're constantly bombarded with the temptation of the darkness. And there are times when we kind of step into the shadows of the darkness and as believers, and we, we do something or we say something or we don't do something that we should, and we find ourselves flirting with the darkness as believers. So John's not saying here that, oh, if you're saved, then you're never going to experience the darkness. No, that's not reality. He's, say, he's saying, no, you're going you're gonna to experience the darkness. You're going you're gonna to flirt with the darkness. We'll talk about this a little bit more in, 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 in later on in the sermon. But, but know this, if you're a believer, you're not occupied with the darkness. You're not camping out over here in the darkness going, I don't even want to be in the light. Sorry, Chad, just warning you. Get back over here. All right, I don't know what today, about today, but man, I am going out of the boundaries today. All right. That rebellious preacher. No. <laughs> but uh, John said, if you're a believer, you won't be occupied with the darkness. It won't consume your thoughts and your attention. If you know Christ. All right. Uh, John 3 verses 20, 21 says this. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. That word doeth there has, that, has the idea of continually doing. So everyone that continually does evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth continually does truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God, that they may give glory in your works. So we read earlier, Matthew, may give glory to God. All right? Really, John 3, 20 21 is a commentary on what John's talking about here. And so that can help you in your understanding. Uh, uh, but we also know that Paul talks about this too. John alludes to it here. He talks about it in the Gospel of John, which we just read, but Paul talks about the fact that as believers, we won't be occupied with darkness, but we're going to struggle. John, or not John, Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 23 says this, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelt in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there you go, talking about that body that's infected by sin, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, that's a mouthful, but understand this. He said, man, I struggle. Man, the sin that I, that I know God hates and that I really don't want to do, man, I find myself doing it. And the good things that I know God wants me to do, that I know can be a blessing, that I know God can use, man, I find myself not doing it. It gets shoved out of my schedule, whatever. Do you identify with this struggle? Yes. Yeah. We all identify with this struggle because we all struggle with sin. We know, man, man I wouldn't do it. Man, man, I did it again. 
And they don't want to do that, but man, so many things get in the way. You know that struggle. Every one of us. This pastor knows that struggle. You as a church member know that struggle. I don't care who they are, it's, it's a believer outside of here, and how eloquent they are, how great they are, they face that struggle. If Paul faced it, I guarantee everybody else faces it. And so know this. John writes this, and he talks about walking in the light here, and he talks about that, but he, 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 he also brings us the truth that we all struggle with the darkness. We all struggle with the sin. Now again, if you profess to be a believer, but you are occupied with it, you are consumed with the darkness, check yourself. That needs to say, hey, you know what? Maybe I just thought, maybe I've just been playing the game. Maybe I, you know, check, had, was there really a time when you put your personal faith in Jesus Christ for you, to be your Savior? Now, but if you're a believer and you say, man, Pastor Sean, I struggle. Man, just this week, yesterday, this morning, I've already messed up. You know what? God knows. God knows your struggle. Man, the, the great apostles, Paul and John, they know your struggle. They went through the same thing. And they wrote scripture. They were used by God to write scripture. You know what? God knows. And there is truth and there is hope in these verses that can be a help to you. So what should this do? What should this idea that, man, there is darkness all around us, the world, our body, man, we, our heart is, it is compromised with it, man, we struggle like Paul would say, what does it cause us to do? Well, five things here. Be humble because of our depravity. Number one, it ought to humble us. It ought to help us see, you know what, as great as I think I am sometimes, as good as I think I'm doing sometimes, I'm just a messed up dude. Man, I just got a lot of problems. And before I lift my voice or point my finger at someone else, I'm going to realize I have nothing, nothing to brag about. And I am messed up. It ought to humble us. Number, number two, it ought, to, it ought to cause us to disdain self-righteous pride. We ought to disdain self-righteous pride. When we're so quick to point fingers or to call somebody else's sin so horrendous and, and, and even go to the point of whatever and we forget about our sin. We forget about our sin. We kind of swipe it under the rug, so to speak. We go, well, oh, that's not so bad. But man, not over there. We got to disdain that as believers. That we should disdain that because we know our struggle. We know, we know, first of all, the darkness that we've been saved out of, but number two, we know the struggle that we still face. Because of our flesh, because of the sin cursed world that we live in. Number three, it ought to help us have understanding with those who are suffering with their sin that they're struggling with or the consequences of their sin. Because why? Because we struggle with the consequences of our sin. So we ought to have understanding with that. We ought to run, number four, to the word of the Lord. Man, that ought to cause us to run to God's word, man. Because, man, there is nothing else that's going to give you hope but this life. This word. And then it ought to help us pray with greater fervency. Which causes us to pray with greater fervency. God, I need you. God, I can't do life without you. God, I, 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 can't, I can't be the light. I can't be your son or daughter without you. God, I need your help. God, help me. And you need to go and, and, and look more into the eyes and the face of your Savior through God's Word daily. Maybe throughout the day, often. So that's the first bond we see this morning. We see the bond of sin nature. But there's, another, there's, there's a second bond we see here. Not only do we see the bond of sin nature, understanding that, you know, if somebody says they've never sinned, but they know God, party huh, down, they're lying. They don't know God. Number two is if they if they profess to know God and they, they say, well, I've reached sinless perfection or I don't have any sin in my life. Ah, liar. <laughs> ding, ding. All right. Alarm should go off. All right. They're struggling somewhere. But there's even something better than that. Bond. The bond of sin nature that we struggle with. But number two is the bond of sunlight. The bond of sunlight. Look at verse five. 
This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Man, praise the Lord. We have a God who is the God of all the heavens and the earth. He is the only God. He's the only wise God. He is the only omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. And in that, he is holy. There's no darkness in him. And so when we have interaction with that God, we know that there's no ulterior motives with him. There is no hate or, or, or despising with him. There is simply, when we go to him, there is a great love for us. But there is a hatred for that sin which so easily besets us. And don't confuse the two. Never, ever confuse the two. God loves the sinner and hates the sin. God loves the believer, but he hates the stain of darkness that sometimes hits us. But he never hates you. He always loves you. There's nothing. I don't care how bad it's, it's been. I don't care how much the guilt and shame will pour over you at times because of what you've done. He has forgiven you. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. But believers, do we really believe that? Do we? I hope so. Because sometimes I've heard believers go, well, and I struggle with this too. Man, I'm going to be real with you for a minute. That dude who molested that child. Can he come to a recognition of his sin and go before God and find forgiveness? Yeah. Now, some of you are where I'm at sometimes. You didn't easily shake your head yet. Because, man, we get so indignant and mad at that. Is it so heinous? But the reality is, Believer, God won't forgive that child molester. That doesn't bode well for us. I'm just being real with you. He can. He will forgive. Man, sometimes I, sometimes we're so quick to say it. And I, I'm included in that. But do we believe it? And I, I believe that we do, for the most part. Sometimes I think we struggle with it, though. Because, man, I don't know. How about this? You know, we all, we've all known, well, maybe we don't know so personally, but we've known someone who's experienced maybe a mom, dad, brother or sister, somebody who was murdered. I mean, just in cold blood, whether it was for vengeance, whether it was just whatever, but they were murdered. Do we believe that that murderer can be forgiven? I hope so. Yeah, I know just a, just a few years ago, I remember watching on the news about a family whose son was murdered and hadn't done anything to deserve murder or that kind of punishment, but he was murdered. And that mom was sitting there in the courtroom and said, we, we forgive you. Person that murdered tears streaming down her face. She said, You know, our son didn't deserve that, but we forgive you. Man, powerful. The world doesn't understand that. But I want you to understand God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Meaning, yes, He's a holy God, but He's also a God who's true to His word. And just as he's promised that he loves us with everlasting love, just as he's promised that he will forgive us of all sin, he will do it. Man, take that to the bank. We have the bond of sunlight. We have God's light that he, uh, in him is no darkness at all. But then look at verse, look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
<clears throat> I love what Jesus said in John 12, 46. He said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. There's hope. There's hope, believer, for that sin that you struggle with that easily besets you or that, uh, know this, there is hope because Jesus can give you the victory. He can deliver you. That's the kind of Jesus that is our Savior. That's the kind of Jesus that you serve. There is his purifying presence that we have as believers that we share. There was a time when we came to understand what the gospel message was, and we turned to Christ, and we put our faith in him, and it brought salvation through, as the Bible says here, the blood of Christ cleansed us from all sin. His blood. Notice this. Understand this. But... This ought to humble us too that the Son of God who was perfect and sinless shed his blood to cleanse us from sin. And it cleanses us from all sin. And nothing is held back, but all of it is cleansed. And faith in Christ makes us not only uh, bring salvation through his blood, but it makes us beacons of his hope. You understand that this morning, as, as a believer, you are glorious to save. You have eternity awaiting you. I mean, you can enjoy eternal life now. That's the great thing about eternal life. It, it's eternally from the, uh, once you have it, it's eternal all the way back, eternal all the way forward. You're, you're enjoying eternal life now. Amen? But you have all the eternity of life with Christ to enjoy. But not only that, but you are a beacon of hope. You are to be a beacon of hope to those around you. Number one, to other believers. All right? You know, the fact of the matter is probably that some of you here are struggling with maybe a sin today, but you know what? There's other people that don't struggle with that sin that you're struggling with. Could be a sin of omission, something you're not doing that you should be doing. Could be a sin of commission, something you're doing that you shouldn't be. And you can find hope because you can look at another believer who's got victory in that area, and you can learn from them. Vice versa, a believer that you've got you've got this area licked in your life doesn't bother you that much. Great, praise the Lord. But that sin that you are dealing with, hey, there's another believer that you can look to, and and they've got that lick. So don't be lifted on pride. Look to the hope that is before us. No, number one, Jesus Christ. But number two, another believers and how God has given them victory in their life. I love Acts 13, 47. It says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Paul's talking to believers, saying, The Lord says, He set you to be a light. We're to be lights. We're to be beacons of hope to the world around us. All right? Now, understanding that and, 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 and carrying that out, that means this week as you go out from here, Man, you need to be a light. You need to be a beacon of hope. Man, Jesus Christ ought to be radiating off of you. Not only because you sat in this worship service day and you worship God and you heard a sermon. I'm not going to say it's a great sermon, but you heard a sermon, all right? But because through your week, you ought to be spending time with Christ. And if you spend time with him, he's going to reflect off you. His light, through your actions, through how you talk to people, it ought to reflect off you. And when you have opportunity, people will ask you, why are you so cheery? Why do you have hope? Why are you so positive? Why, why, why? Then you can give the answer. Hey, you can give them the gospel. You can be that light, that beacon. Notice this, though. Some will react with fear towards that light. Acts 22, 9. And they that were with me, Paul's talking about the people that were with him, saw indeed the light and were afraid but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. You know, unfortunately, there's going to be a reaction sometimes as you live the life of a believer and try to let your light shine. Some people are going to be afraid of that. It's my matter. And they'll, because of that, they'll react in different ways because of their fear. All right? So sometimes they'll be hateful in the way they respond to you, angry, frustrated. Jealous, whatever. But just be careful and remember that, hey, that's going to happen. My job is just to continue to shine the light. Shine the light. And when they react to you because of your light in some way, 
Don't be mean or hateful or frustrated back. Just give them a shining light. Shining light. Man, creatures of the dark, man, they cower at, at, you know, you ever been, you ever walked into a room at night? Well, hopefully not. But you ever walked into a room and you flip on the light, roach is scurry, that's what they do, all right? Hopefully you don't have that problem in your house. <laughs> but if you do, bug scurry, right? They, they head for the, the darkness because they don't like light, all right? Um, and so, man, that's the world around us. Man, they're just where we were at at one time. Creatures of the dark, lost in darkness, and they won't like the light when it comes. Some will be attracted. Some will say, man, I don't want to know about that. But many will react with fear. All right, the light within also reflects in our relationships. It also reflects in our relationships. Um, look at verse 7 again. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So that fellowship that's here, I'm not fellowship but among believers, particularly here in that verse. And so we have that fellowship, all right? Understand that we had that. We talked about fellowship last week, so I'm not going to belabor that point. But our light ought to reflect within our relationships. What does that mean? Um, it means that in your relationship with one another as believers, we ought to treat each other with grace and kindness and, and, and mercy. We ought to have to be patient with one another. But the same with the world around us. We ought to reflect in our relationships with those in the world around us. Uh, one passage of scripture says this, in alluding to our relationships with those who are lost, says, Do not unequally yoke together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, what communion hath light with darkness. Again, going back to the light and the darkness, as 2 Corinthians 6 14. So our, if that light reflects in our relationship, how does it? We do not react and respond as the world does. So we should not find ourselves reacting, responding in relationships as the world does. Not only that, but we do not enter into deep covenant relationships with those still in the darkness. What do I mean by that? Well, here's some examples of that. You ought, if you're a believer, you ought not marry an unbeliever. Enter into marriage with an unbeliever. All right? If, if you're great in business and you have an opportunity that comes up and you're a Christian businessman and you have somebody that's not a Christian businessman, you ought not enter into that kind of relationship, all right, with that with somebody who's lost, all right, um, and then you might even uh, uh, some other different examples of that may exist as well. But that doesn't mean that we don't have relationships with those who are lost. We ought to. How else are you going to spread the light of Jesus and share the gospel if you don't have a relationship? You got to. You reach out and you have friends that are lost. Jesus went and ate with sinners. How many times? Often. Ate with some of the most hated sinners. Cast collector. Nobody liked him. Jews didn't like him. Gentiles didn't really like him either. <laughs> All right? And so, man, we've got to have friendships, but be careful of any entering into those deep covenant relationships. All right? Uh, but you say, well, Pastor Sean, what if I'm in business? And, you know, I've, I've already had that. It was pre existing. I have a relationship with a business partner, and, and I'm saving he's not. What, what, no, you don't break that. But understand that the great spiritual struggle that's going to exist in that relationship. And you're going to have to respond, all right, or relate to that with mercy, grace, and truth. All right, hey, same thing with a, if you're you saying, well, Pastor Sean, I got saved, but I'm, I'm, my husband or my spouse, my wife is an unbeliever. You know, how, how, how do I deal with that? Do I, do I, am I supposed to just divorce? No. No. You, ought to, you just got to understand the great spiritual struggle that's going to exist in that relationship. And you need to respond with mercy, grace, and truth to that. I, I love just a real short, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it'll take much longer than we have, but I remember hearing an evangelist and his wife talk about their testimony. And she was saved as a wife, and he was blocked as a husband. And uh, he drank, he did all kinds of stuff, but he would come home and he'd work late shifts and He'd come home and wake her up and say, make me a sandwich for me. And she'd go in there and she'd make him. And sometimes he'd bring a friend home from work. And they'd be in there playing cards or whatever. Make us a sandwich. And she said, I did it. I made him a sandwich. She said, you know why? Because I understood the truth that the best my husband was ever going to get in his lost condition is what he got now in this world. And the best I'm going to get is still to come. And it's only going to get better. So I made him a sandwich. And 
I treated, and she said, you know what? And he said, man, time after time of all that treatment, finally, and I, just again, for the sake of just condensing it, he heard the gospel, he got saved, man, now God had grown into the place where he was traveling as an evangelist and, and preaching God's word, and she was traveling right along with him, but God used that because of a woman, a wife, who said, you know what, I understand the spiritual struggle that's going on in this relationship, and I'm trusting Jesus, and he's going to do something. And he did. Praise God. But as we got to understand that of his purifying presence, the fact that when, when Christ comes into our life, man, he purifies us. We don't live in the darkness anymore. We live in the light. And as his light, we ought to shine and we ought to be beacons of hope. Not only that, he's unifying his fellowship. He talks about that, that is in verse 7 there, that we have fellowship with one another through Christ. Um, Acts 26, 18 says this, to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are, by, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so, man, what does that mean? That means that to the world around us, for us as believers, we have this great fellowship, this unifying fellowship with Christ, and it's centered on Christ. But we also can't forget about the world around us and the fact that, man, we ought to be reaching them so they can come into fellowship. This great fellowship that we have, unifying fellowship in Jesus. It's not a, well, you stay out there because you can't partake of this. No, it's come on, come on, we want you to be a part of this too. And then the last thing we see under this second bond of the Son of Light is this, his faithful forgiveness and cleansing. <laughs> Look back at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God this morning, he is faithful to forgive and cleanse us from our sin. Now, notice this verse is this. This chapter, this book is written to believers. John is writing to believers here. And when he says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness, he's talking about saved people. He's not talking about them getting saved again, though. He's talking about them going to cry to God and confessing when they get in the shadows of the darkness and they get back to the light and they confess it. He's talking about, hey, when you've been in the shadows for a bit, Come back, confess to God, get it right. He will forgive you and he will cleanse you. He won't say, uh-huh, yeah, you're back now. No, no, I'm not going to forgive you this time. No, he doesn't do that. He'll forgive us every time. When you come and you confess it. Now, what does confess mean? It means to agree with God about your sin. That's what confession means. It means to agree with God about your sin. So whatever that is, you have to look to God's word. Oh, yeah, that's not good, Lord. Yeah, I messed up. And I sinned. And this is not right. And I was a gossip. I was jealous. I was hateful. I was you throw the money. And you agree with God about your sin. <clears throat> and he will cleanse you and forgive you. And you know why? I think the greatest reason why. Yes, he loves us. He loves us and and that's the basis of why. But I believe one of the reasons why is because, again, we are his light to the world around us. So, of course, he wants to clean us all up, get us right on, back on track so that we can be the light that we're called to be, so that people can see him and that they will be drawn to him and that we can give him glory. Romans 13, 12, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. A little bit further down in that chapter, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the armor of light is putting on Jesus, spending time with him. But ye are a chosen generation, 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we're called to do, to be beacons of hope. We have this bond, believer. This bond of the sun, light, the light of the sun. So recognize the bond, that we are joined together by the pressure of sin. A pressure of sin. We have been through it. 
we still face it. We are bonded by the pressure of sin. We're bonded by the heat of the light of the world. We have come in Jesus Christ. He has purified us. He has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light and the adhesive of the Holy Spirit. We have a Holy Spirit that's been given to us that resides in our heart and he bonds us together as an adhesive substance. That person of the Godhead, that third person. And we have this wonderful bond as believers. More powerful than anything on this earth. Than super glue or whatever else you can come up with. Man, let's recognize it and let's go out today living out of these bonds that we have together. Heavenly Father, I pray you help us today. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your word. God, I'm thankful that we have this family of God. Lord, what a, what a tremendous blessing it is. I'm fearful that sometimes, Lord, and we, we take it for granted what we have in Christ. And Lord, we have this wonderful blessing of a church family. We have the wonderful blessing of the bond of Christ, of the bond of our fight against sin, the bond of the sunlight as believers all around this world. Man, we, can, we can go to another nation and sit down with a believer and we have a bond. So strong, Lord. God, I pray you help us. God, help us this week to live that out. God, and with those who are struggling with, with sin, with flirting with the darkness, help them this week to have victory. God, help them to come to you and confess it, make it right. God, for some that, Lord, they're struggling, struggling with recognizing your forgiveness and your great love. Man, just time and again, the, the Satan and the, and, the, and the world throws back in their face something they've done. God, help them to realize that you've forgiven them, that it's settled as far as the east is from the west. And that they should be encouraged and have faith and have hope because their Savior loves them. And God, I pray, I pray for us men who are struggling, Lord, with being the beacons of life that we are. God, help us in our relationships to realize that we have the strong bond together, but Lord, also to go out and be lights to the world around us. The darkness that we face, Lord, every day, God, we have that in common, that we face this enemy. Lord, Satan in darkness. But God, I pray you help us to have victory even this week. Help us to go out there and be reflections of your love and of your son. Lord Jesus, help us in that. We ask you for your name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? As they play, as they sing, would you just come do business with God in the altar, wherever God plays upon your heart, and just come do business with him and as we sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of
offering, though, and then come and collect your offering while I give you something else. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. God, I pray that you would just uh, show yourself strong on behalf of your people even this week. Lord, we just thank you for this past week, how you showed yourself strong on behalf of your people in so many instances, Lord. We just lift up your praises and we thank you for it. Bless the gift and the giver as we give back just a portion of what you have blessed us with. We ask your precious name. Amen. You can be seated while the ushers come, and then I just want to share a couple things with you. Number one, we have these hope cards right out there in the foyer. Grab some of those. They're in stacks of five and hand those out. Be inviting people to church. They have the gospel right on them, so you can share that with them, all right? Also, just want to mention that next Sunday, next Sunday, we have our outdoor service and cookout. So, uh, Brother John, come on over here next to me while we make this announcement together. All right, he's checking with his mic, but that's going to be at 10 a.m. We're starting the normal time of the service. All right, we're going to have service right out front there. All right, this is weather permitted. If it's stormy next Sunday, we're going to move it inside, all right, just so you know that. But if we got good weather, we're going to be outside. And then afterwards, there'll be no connection groups, but there will be a cookout. So we're just going to enjoy some burgers and hot dogs together. And there'll be, uh, I think we have a bounce house back there. We'll try to get that out, get that set up. That'll be there. We'll have some games and stuff. That'll be a good time together. Some lawn games, ladder ball, stuff like that. But it's just a good time to fellowship together. And then uh, this Saturday, this Saturday is on our calendar is the Zenders Lunch and Shop. All right. So we've done this before in the past. Just as a church family, if you want to come out, uh, we're going to meet in Frankenmuth at Zenders. That's what I understand. Is that usually how it goes, brother? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I can tell you how to get there. All right. He can tell you how to get there. But meet at noon at Zenders. But we do need to count um, so that we can kind of let them know, hey, we need this room for this many people. So if you think you're, uh, if you think there's a good chance that you're going to be joining us for the uh, Zenders Lunch and Shop, we're just going to eat lunch at Zenders and then shop as much as you want together down there. If you think you might like to join that, just lift up your hands and we can get a count here. I see one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Anybody else? Nine. Anybody else? All right, ten. All right, all right. So we're going to go with, well, I've got to add my family out there, so that's like 20. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll have a good time. That'll be a good number. So thank you for giving us that as well. If you if you say, Pastor Sean, I decide that during the week that I want to go as well, man, just just call it the church. You can call me. You can call my cell phone. I think it's in the, um, the bulletin there. You can call that number. Um, and, or send us an email at the church thing. All right. And then Wednesday night Bible study. I want to encourage you to come out for Wednesday night Bible study. We have a good time at Wednesday night Bible study, don't we? we do. And we're studying a uh, New Testament survey right now. So we're, so we're going through the New Testament, looking at each book of the New Testament, kind of getting a survey understanding of it. So it's kind of like the 10,000 foot look at it, not the you know ground level. So, But we're enjoying it. And uh, I just want to give you a little tease for coming up. After we get done with our New Testament survey, I got a great series that God has laid on my heart that we're going to do on Wednesday nights. It's going to be called, we're going to study the biblical practice of lament. The biblical practice of lament. So if you'd like to find out more about that, then you'll want to join us for that, and there'll be more information about that. Well, Brother John, I ask you to stay up here because, man, we are your church family. We've been praying for you this week. Praying for Kevin and Courtney, and we as a church family just wanted to get together and give you guys something to help you guys as well as Kevin and Courtney out. So we have these cards that are gift to you guys. Um, there's some stuff to help with expenses in there for Kevin, Courtney, and you guys. And uh, just want you to know you are loved. You didn't have to do this. Uh, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so. We love, we love you, John. That's right. Uh, good. I mean, she is a little uh, pistol 
that little girl, and she's doing really good. But uh, pray for her. She's got you know a couple more things she's gonna be going through, and and uh, but you pray for them, pray for that family, to lift them up to the Lord, as well as another church family and the things that they got coming up. So it isn't it good to be a part of the family of God? Amen. 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 All right, you guys are dismissed. Don't forget, connection group will be meeting in here, and then my connection group will be meeting between by the kitchen there. <laughs>